like victory day. William that Moultrie, actually, William Moultrie said that should be the day of South Carolina. Well, you're looking at William well, Moultrie right there. Now, when I leave the troops for the field. Good. He said that should be the day of South Carolina's independence. Now, turning over to the well-appointed officials of the state and no longer on the journey of rule of Great Britain and the turn is king across the sea. I'm still working on my lines. I haven't got it there yet. <laughs> now, for those who would like to attend, the parade will begin at, well, first military, 1400 for civilians, 2 p.m. at the corner of Meeting and Calhoun Street, across from Merriam Square. It will proceed down the center of Calhoun to Liberty Square, where British reenactors, why I have no idea anyone would, but will retire the King's colors, and the second, South Carolina, will raise Betsy Ross, followed by and addressed by General Nathaniel Green and William Moultrie. The Washington Light uh, Infantry will lay a wreath for all those who fell in the line of duty during the 31-month occupation, uh, occupation. It will also include an address by uh, the mayor, a presentation by Charleston's uh, historian, Dr. Nick Butler, and a uh, person uh, giving a presentation on the African American experience. And we'll also have Mrs. Katie Green, who will give a, an interpretation of the female role in the American Revolution. Now, there is a website, and you can go on it uh, for further uh, information. The uh, point of contact, the POC, is a gentleman by the name of Ken Scarlett, S-C-A-R-L-E-T-T, -T, who is the president uh, of Revolutionary uh, Charleston. Do I have five or ten more minutes, George? You do. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. What's that name of the website? What's the name of the website? Um, I would uh, just type in Victory Day Charleston, South Carolina. Just like my students, when in doubt, Google it out. The way I ended my unit on the American Revolution, I talked with my students about the legacy of the American Revolution. Probably the greatest legacy of the American Revolution obviously are independent, but those immortal 56 words. And we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent government. But there are other legacies and heirs as we are of the American Revolution. I want to share this with you. My last tour of duty, and I couldn't have it better, as professor of naval science at Villanova and New Penn. And I was sitting in my office, it was in the summertime, and it's pretty slow for NROTC and no students. And I got a call from the good father president to Catholic University. And yes, I'm not a Huguenot, I'm a French Catholic. And he said, Ed? Yes, Father. He said, you come over to my office? I've got a favor to ask. I'll be right there. Now, Villanova and the Navy Department has a very close association. Because during the 1930s, Villanova was in the red. And it was feared that it would go under. So the Navy Department, seeing war clouds gathering in Europe, offered up the V-12 program, which is today is the NROTC program, to commission young men and women as Navy and Marine Corps officers. And from that point on, my office or my building was right next to the Father President's. And so I go running over there. He goes, sit down there. He said, I got a favor. I said, Father, consider it done. He goes, no, I want you to listen. You know Father Owens, 
just passed away. Yes, I know that. Did you know that he was a former Marine? And I said, no, Father. Because he used to come over to my office all the time and we'd just talk. And if I had any midshipmen who needed counseling, et cetera, et cetera, I would send him to see Father Owens. He said, no, Father, I didn't, I didn't know that. Ironically, he was the chairperson of the Department of Peace and Justice. And he said, Ed, do you know that he was a sergeant in Korea, in the Korean War? I said, no, Father, I, I didn't. He goes, well, he made a pact with God that if God brought him home, that he would devote the rest of his life to Christ. I said, what's the request, Father? He goes, well, he wants to be buried with full Marine Corps honors. Consider it done. So I got all sergeants, buglers, flag, everything. It was a beautiful afternoon in the priest cemetery. Thousands of students. It is one of the hardest things I've ever had to do is present that flag to his mom. Somehow for children to outlive their parents just doesn't seem right. So I did a little research. How many folds do you think are in this flag? There's 13. Why 13? That's an unlucky number, isn't it? Why 13? It represents what? The 13 colonies, now states. Why this shape? Anybody? Why this shape? Tricorner. Tricorner. Why the stars? You end up with the stars facing upward. You got to remember what we were going up against. We were going up against what? The greatest military on the face of the earth at this time. We were going to need all the help we could get. Especially from the Almighty. Why 21 guns? The 21 gun salute. Why 21? Why not 15 or 13? Why 21? Add up the numeral 1776. And what do you get? <coughs> you get 21. <coughs> I've listened ad nauseum to many historians <laughs> talk about Yorktown as being the last battle of the American Revolution. I had my own last battle of the American Revolution. But it wouldn't occur until 17 September, 1787. Why did I pick that? 17 September, 1787. What happened on that day? The Constitution was ratified. The Constitution of the United States was ratified. And that Constitution is the envy of the world. And I, I am not ashamed to say that. In fact, I'm quite proud of that. Many nations' constitutions begin with those three words. What three words? We the what? We the people. That ordinary people, no disrespect. Ordinary people like you and I can and will be able to what? Governors. Govern themselves. Ben Franklin, by this time, if George Washington is the father of our country, then Ben's got to be the grandfather of our country. In 1787, Ben was suffering from a severe case of gout. 
and he had to be carried back and forth from his home, which was maybe within two blocks of what is now Independence Hall. And he would have prisoners from the Walnut Street prison carry him in a sedan chair that he liked when he saw it in France. And they were carrying him home after a hard day. He wasn't going to the city tavern that night. And a female stopped him on the street. He said, Mr. Franklin, and you know Ben couldn't pass up a skirt. He said, Mr. Franklin, yes, ma'am, I have a question for you. Well, what's that question? So what, haven't you, what have you given us? Because remember, the Constitutional Convention is top secret. Somehow I can't imagine that today. Frank, Mr. Franklin thought about it in a while.